and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Today, um, we will renew our church covenant, as I've said, you know, the covenant is a very simple expression of how we desire to join our lives to the Lord and to one another here. Um, We want to be intentional. And we join our lives together for the sake of the gospel. Um, If the gospel was not the key, if the Holy Spirit was not imparted, then we'd just simply be um, a benevolent organization seeking to do good in the town. But we are called to bring forth the good news of Jesus Christ. I chose Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18, um, as our text today because I believe that, that Paul is reminding, he reminded the church in Philippi, but he reminds us today um, that we, uh, you know, why we are gathered as his church. What is our purpose? And, and as I looked at this text, it really drew out the heart of why we covenant together. So let's um, read this. You can follow as I read, starting in verse 12. It says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe, as you hold out the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on a sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too may be glad and rejoice with me. Now, in verse 12, Paul starts with therefore. And whenever you see a therefore, it's always a concluding statement. In seminary, the professor said, whenever you see a therefore, you have to ask, why is it therefore? And um, um, get that? (laughs) Margaret's working. (laughs) But Paul is concluding. He actually started his exhortation back in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, where he says, I urge you to conduct yourselves in a way that's worthy of the gospel, that we, we, uh, our walk needs to be in a manner that's glorifying to God and worthy of the gospel. And, and he starts that exhortation. He continues it in the beginning of chapter 2 uh, where he says, you know, that we are called to be like-minded. We have the same mind and the same heart, that, 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 that there's got to be a unity within the church. And then he has the example of Jesus, that very famous quote where the gospel is captured in a nutshell, where he says, have the same attitude that Jesus had. You know, though he were God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped and held on to, but he humbled himself and made himself of, of no report and, and becoming a servant, took on the nature of man, became obedient even unto death on the cross, and God exalted him and raised him to the highest place. And so Jesus becomes the example of what it means to be united um, in purpose, be united in the will of God. And, and so Paul is developing this exhortation, and, and then he comes to verse 12 where he says, My dear friends, on the basis of everything that I said, I know that you've walked in obedience, not only in my presence but in my absence. He says, So continue. Continue to walk out your lives in a manner worthy of the gospel, faithful to the call to follow Jesus. He says it this way, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I remember 
you know, when I first read this years and years ago, I thought, what's he talking about? Aren't we saved by grace? It's, it's not by the works that we are saved. So why is he saying continue to work out your salvation? We can't work it out. It's given to us. What Paul is saying is not that we add our works to our salvation. God saves us by his grace. We're saved when we put our faith in Jesus. It's a free gift. It's not based on how well we live, how good we look, how nicely we sing, or anything else. Because if it was, then we could boast in it. But Paul is saying here, work out, continue to work out your salvation. That is to allow our relationship with Jesus to affect every part of our lives. That's really what he's saying. He says, if you've given your life to Jesus, you've decided to follow him, he is your Lord, how does that impact the way you live? How does that impact your relationships with one another? He says, let your salvation be worked into your life. That's exactly what he's saying. Now, we can go to the gym and work out, right? Some of us do that. And when we work out, um, the purpose of that is to strengthen our muscles, so that our muscles become stronger and, uh, and for whatever purpose, whether it's playing a sport or running or climbing a mountain, whatever, that, that we work out and what we're doing is we're working into our body a strength. Do you know when we work out our salvation, we're taking our salvation to the gym and in faith, we are causing our muscles of faith to grow stronger. We're working something into our daily life so that our Christianity is not just simply something we do on Sunday morning or something I think about when things are going rough, but rather I am working out my relationship with Jesus in the way I live, in the way I treat one another, okay? Um, Another thought I had was, um, you know, we can work, um, uh, when, when you have like, leather a leather coat or leather shoes you can get the stuff that you can work into the leather to make it soft and we work it in it's just another way of thinking Paul is saying that that our relationship with Jesus which he calls our salvation is something that needs to be worked into our lives and when we do that it changes the way we live we live out or demonstrate what it means to be saved by grace. And we do that for the sake of the world. So why does he say with fear and trembling? We can't lose our salvation. It was given to us as a gift. You know, we can't lose it. It, 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 We weren't saved by our works. We can't lose it by our works. Paul says fear and trembling because this is an important thing. Imagine that you had a speech to give in front of a large crowd of people in a very important gathering. Uh, Imagine you were president of the United States and you had to give the State of the Union address. Would there be any fear and trembling in you as you walk to that podium? (laughs) Why is your fear and trembling? Are you afraid? No, it's important. And Paul says we work our salvation into our lives with fear and trembling because it's important. And so it's not with dread. It's not with, oh no, what happens if I make a mistake? That's not the issue. We will make mistakes. We're not going to do it perfectly. We're going to have stuff that God needs to continue to work into us. Now imagine if you were a baseball player and you got hired by the Red Sox and you're going to be the DH. You're going to go to the bat. Do you have to hit a home run every single time? Of course not. Are you going to strike out sometimes? Yes. In fact, if you hit three out of ten, they'll give you an award. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) And if you hit two out of ten, they'll still pay you. (laughs) And if you hit 5 out of 10, they're going to test you for drugs. So anyways, (laughs) that's the way it is with our Christianity. We're not going to hit 10 out of 10. But God says, 
as you practice, it becomes more consistent. All right? And, and, but there's a sense of this is important. I want to take it seriously. And so we continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But look what he says next in verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good pleasure. Now, the, when we work out our salvation, that's one Greek word that's different than the word where it says God works in you. Where it says God works in you is the Greek word that we translate into energize. That's the word for energy. And, and when God works in us, he imparts to us, empowers us with his energy so that we, by God's working in our life, desire, our will is turned, that we will to do God's good pleasure, and we are empowered to do God's good pleasure. He says to will and to act. Now, in order to act, we need God's power in us. And so God says, as we work out our salvation, as we seek to open our lives up to the power of the Holy Spirit, as we give ourselves and say, Lord, use me, right? That's working out our salvation. That God comes and he indwells us and he empowers us on the inside so that we desire to act and we desire to walk out his will. That's what Paul is saying here. It is God who is working in us. We work at making our salvation real every day, but it is God who is at work in us. And God gives us that ability. Now, when we look at Christian ethics, ethics is the, the um, code by which I live my life. Christian ethics is not about us seeking to say, okay, I am going to keep this code of rules. Watch me keep it perfectly. Christian ethics is not about that. It's not about, you know, l making my life conform to some kind of set of rules. Rather, it begins when our mind is transformed by God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, by the mercies of God, we present our bodies as living sacrifices. In chapter, in verse 2, it says, we are not conformed to the thinking of the world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. And it begins by having our minds renewed so that we no longer want to be conformed to the way the community, the society around us thinks. We want to be conformed to the way God thinks. And, in, and when that happens, when the Holy Spirit comes and invades our life and changes us, then we begin to desire to know the character of God and the will of God. And then we are able to be empowered to live out the purposes of God. It is God who enables us to do that. We can't do that by ourselves. Now, we don't obey the Lord. I mean, that's the working out of our salvation, where we walk in obedience. We don't obey him because if we don't, we're afraid of punishment. Oh, no, what happens? I better do this right or else God's going to send a lightning bolt from heaven. <laughs> that's not the way it works. Rather... Because we belong to Jesus, because we are his, because we have been changed on the inside, converted, and, and our lives have been invaded by the power of the Holy Spirit, God creates in us a new desire to do his will. Have you experienced that in your life? I have. I'm not the same person I was you know, as a 20-year-old college student who gave his life to Jesus. And even two years later, you know, I'm a whole lot different than, than my two-year-old saved person. Because God works something in us, and we begin to desire to do his will. Not out of compulsion, but out of love. And so Paul says, God does this, and then, how do we live it out? What does it look like? Verse 14, 
he goes through and he says, do everything without complaining and arguing. Now, in a church, that's a miracle. <laughs> you know, you got five Baptists or four Baptists in a room. You got five opinions. Um, it's not a question of, you know, we can't have our own opinions, but the contentiousness that Paul's addressing in Philippians. He says, do it without complaining and arguing. Why? So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. It's our witness. It's the attitude that we have toward one another when we work our salvation into our lives. We begin to love one another and show grace to one another and be humble. And, we, and we're able to, um, you know, uh, bear one another's sins. What does that mean? It means when someone does something that's not right, we don't get offended. We love them. It takes the grace of God to do that. And, and Paul is saying when we do that, um, um, we become united in heart and action. We are able to guard relationships. And we're able to be pure and blameless, shining forth as God's children in a world that is dark. And then he says this. He says, work, you know, as, as we work out our salvation and, and we become without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, he says, in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. We shine like stars in the universe. And we get to hold out the word of life. Now, light dispels darkness. If this room were absolutely darkened, so that there was no light, and I lit a match, that match would be pretty bright, wouldn't it? If I lit a match today and held it up right where it is right now, you're looking, you say, I can see a match burning, but it, the, 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 the power of that light, that little light, doesn't really have an impact until the light goes down. And Paul says that, that we're living in a dark world, a depraved world, a world where people don't know God, don't know the peace and the love that comes from God, and that our lives are like those matches that are lit. And as the, the, as the culture goes darker, the, la- the matches shine brighter. That's our life. And when we live out the gospel there is something that becomes attractive to other people. If you're in a dark, dark place and you see a light, what do you do? Head toward it. People will head toward the light of Jesus shining in us. Um, That's the power of light. And in one little light can change. And then what happens if you have several lights come together? You know, and we have a church that shines like a light. In fact, in Revelation, it talks about the churches being represented as lampstands. He says, you know, don't let me come and take away the lampstand. We are lights in our community, and we get to, to hold out the word of life. Now, we don't force it on people, but we invite. We get to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We hold out the hope the word of life. As people are drawn and they look and they say, how can you have peace in such a time as this? How can you go through that and, and, and experience the peace of God? I, I want to know that. I don't know what that is. And we hold out the word of life. We're inviting people to take one step closer to Jesus. We're inviting people to, to begin to read God's word and we can lead them through that. We're inviting people to, to begin to pray and ask God for something. Just little steps, one little step. We hold out the word of life. When we covenant together, our purpose for covenanting together is so that we might shine as stars in a dark world. That we might demonstrate the truth and the power of the gospel that people might understand the love of God. And we join together as a church in order to hold out the word of life. Our covenant basically does that. 
says, having received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and having been baptized as a believer and being in agreement with this church's statements, strategies, and structure, I now feel led by the Holy Spirit to unite with or renew my commitment to this, to this church family. In doing so, I commit myself to God and to other members to do the following. I will protect the unity of my church. How? By acting in love toward other members, by refusing to gossip, by following the leaders. I will share the responsibility of my church. How? By praying for its growth, by inviting the unchurched to attend, by warmly welcoming those who visit. I will serve the ministry of my church. How? By discovering my gifts and talents, by equipping by being equipped to serve by my pastors, by developing a servant's heart. And I will support the testimony of my church. How? By faithfully attending and by living a godly life and by giving regularly. These are some of the things that we just put down and say, as we join together, we want to shine as lights and be a testimony to those around us. We want to be able to lift one another up in love. We want to be that church family for one another. And, um, and today we get to renew this. This is why we worship together. This is why we work together, so that others would see the reality of God's word living in us, that Jesus would be the light in us that draws others to salvation when we give our lives to the Lord and to one another, we shine as stars. When we allow God's energy to be at work in us, we shine as stars. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can be a church that joins together in your love around your salvation for the purpose of being on mission for you. Lord, you have ignited our hearts, not only with a love for you, but with a love for one another. And we thank you, Lord. I just thank you for this church, this body of faith. And Lord, as we covenant together, I pray that you would anoint us with your spirit. That, uh, that, that, you know, you said that one can send a thousand and two can send ten thousand. Lord, that you would multiply the effectiveness of our ministry and our community. Lord, that there would be those who will come to put their trust in Jesus this year. Right now, they have no clue. But Lord, we believe that there will be people who will be saved this year through the witness of us shining as stars. And so, Lord, as we covenant together, We ask, Lord, for your anointing and for your presence. In Jesus' name.